right, I'm not going to tell you to turn your phones off. I'm sure that's a lot to ask, but if you could put your phones on silent or vibrate, that'd be awesome. Great, so thanks for coming to tonight's program. Uh, the topic is hazing and alcohol education, so I want to introduce our featured speaker. Mike Green is president and founder of Collegiate Consultants. For over the past 18 years, he's presented on more than 2,000 college campuses nationwide in his effort to make drug and alcohol awareness and education an integral part of every student's life. He serves as a consultant to student affairs and athletic departments on numerous universities including Boston College, Florida State, Penn State, Brown, Princeton, and the University of Vermont. Mike has been a participant and coach on both the high school and college levels, and his background as an athlete, coach, and educator gives him the know-how to connect with today's youth. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Mike Green. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I need to explain how I got in this job. I was happy coaching football at a school called Westchester University. Defensive line coach. Played college football there, came out All-American, went on to the pros for a couple years, got cut, came back, coached, and I loved my job. One day I had the coach from the uh, Philadelphia Flyers come down and watch practice. And he said, you know something? His name is Bobby Clark. He goes, I'd like you to come down and speak to my team. We have some alcohol issues. Because in fact, we had one of our goalies killed in a drink and a driving accident. Could you come down and speak to him? I said, certainly. You know, and I said to him, I'm not gonna walk in there and tell him not to drink. I'm gonna come in there and talk about social behaviors with socializing the right way. No one's gonna walk in here and take your drink away. No one's gonna walk in here and tell you not to drink. It's your choice to do that. And I said, the reason I got that job back then is that I am a recovering alcoholic. And by the way, I just celebrated 38 years being sober living in this I get on my knees every morning. I ask God to keep me sober. I thank him again at nighttime, and I pray all day. And the reason I got into this job, because you know what? Not too many people make it when they get as bad as I did. It's one out of every 10 may stay sober. We've already lost a person in our family, my brother's son, drug overdose, and you know, he said, you're absolutely right with that. How many people have to go down because of all this stuff? I said, it's not only that, because when I speak to you guys, I have very few of you will ever be alcoholic, but a lot of you are going to get into trouble with alcohol. Because it's great. You got to face it, it's fun. You have a good time. I never saw anybody go out like this, so oh, I'm going drinking tonight. Worst night I'm ever going to have. You got this smile on your face. There's this little gleam there. And you can tell the person's going, oh, oh, oh. Tonight, I'm getting drunk because I deserve it. How many know what I mean by that? I'm getting drunk because I deserve it. That's kind of a thing that's ingrained sometimes in sports all over the United States. That's what got me. Because that was good on the field, but I was better drinking. I mean, when I went out there, it's no whole bars. The two years out of college, I almost took my life because I couldn't live with drinking, I couldn't live without it. So when I got sober and I started speaking, I started noticing that most of the people in the crowd were an alcoholic. So how do we help you guys? We make you smarter, we make you reduce the risk, we make you look out better, and if you choose to drink, have a good time with us. Today I also work for the Pittsburgh Pirates. I go to camp with them. And the big thing that our coach gets across is this, respect it, be responsible. When you go out, you have teammates, it's your family. Don't get caught up in the hazy, don't get caught up in all the crap that goes on. And I think you can learn that if you can look at this the right way. I'm not here to change your drinking, just to get you looking a little bit different. How many in the room have ever had an alcohol problem? How many have had an alcohol problem? Nobody. How many of you drink? Raise your hand. Oh, right, now look how tough that is. How many have ever tasted alcohol? How many have tasted it? 
So just to say, Chase, you kind of look around, no coaches in the room, some going like this a little bit. How many have experienced being drunk? And look at the smiles on your face about being drunk. How many have thrown up because of a night drinking? How many felt, how many felt totally shitty the next day because of a night drinking? How many had the shits the next day because of a night drinking? How many have seen one of your friends pee in the wrong place because of a night drinking? In college, you go like this, yo, go up on that roof and pee on those people. And the guy does it, the people on the ground are so drunk, they think it's raining outside. How many have had an alcohol problem? You know, at Penn State, one of our players stood up and went like this. You know, you had us laughing. And you got to say, relax. Don't call the problem. Call it something that relates to us. Oh, that was a good point. Because I wouldn't call you problems. I'd call you one-nighters. One-nighters are a short-term problem of one night that has a consequence or a funny story with it. Usually when you social drink, people go out and they sip it, they taste it, they enjoy it, they socialize, they have a good time, they christen it a party. But the people in college, when you say, I'm going out to get drunk, look at the words you use. I'm getting wasted, trashed, garbage, pounded, hammered, destroyed, annihilated. And there's two terms I'm not going to use. Because some of you, how many know what I mean by turned up? How about effed up? There you go, that's what I mean. I'm trying to be nice and correct tonight, but that's the biggest thing is people go, oh, I'm going out to get effed up tonight. An alcoholics Anonymous. We have a little joke. I'm addicted to the 51st state of the union. It's a state of being effed up. Why would you want it? You want to give up your drinking for the rest of your life? And the big thing about this is, most of you wouldn't. But we don't need you killed in a drinking and driving accident like the Flyers because you got drunk one night, got behind the wheel of the car, took your Porsche over and killed. And one of the players said, and now they hire you, Granny. They should have had you out here before this. You're almost like our socializing coach. It made a lot of sense what you were saying. Just to get people to listen can make a big difference at that point. So I'm going to call you one-nighters. Short-term problem of one night that has a consequence. I'll give you one of mine back in college. I got engaged my senior year. Beautiful young lady. My friends took me out and played the game Power Hour. How many have heard of Power Hour? One shot of beer every minute for 60 straight minutes. I did 90 of them. Never so drunk in my life. I stumbled over my fiance's and knocked on the door and go, oh, I forgot. She invited her parents up to meet me for the first time. She looked at me and said, you can't meet my parents looking like that. Go in the bedroom and sleep it off. And the next day she said, do you know what you did last night? Two hours later, I'm sitting on the couch talking to my parents. You walk out in front of us totally naked, no clothes on. Walk directly over to the TV, turned it on, and peed in front of the TV. <laughs> I peed in front of the TV naked in front of your parents. Are you sure it was me? Well, who else would it be? And she gave me the ring back. And she said to me, which I never forgot, you'll never get a second chance to make a first impression. And that's pretty good. As an athlete, you really got to remember that. You may not get a second chance to make that first impression because you're under the microscope all the time. You got TV, newspaper coaches looking at you all the time. You have to be careful where you go, what you do. And the guys that took me out to play that game Power Hour, I really believe they were my buddies. But that's a form of hazing. When it's a special occasion, and they go like this, oh, it's his 21st birthday. We're getting them tonight. That attitude of getting somebody, that you can't lay off until they're throwing up sick all over the place. It gets a lot of people in trouble. 
That's kind of what happened to me. You get caught up with your buddies. You're having a good time. You don't think it's going to affect you like that. And the next thing you know, you're drunk and you're doing anything wild and anything crazy. And you know what? I never really believed when I was in college that hazing was a big thing. I thought everybody does it. We're all on teams. I mean, we all work out together. We pay the price. You know what? We go out to have a good time. That's our business. We wouldn't hurt any of our players. And I really had that kind of attitude until one of the first speeches I gave out at Ohio State, the guy says to me, the woman who's going to speak first, I thought she would like. Her name was Eileen Stevens. And she walks up there and she had three things. She had a six pack of beer. She had a fifth of whiskey. And she had a quart of wine. And I thought to myself, boy, that's a big night for somebody over there. Look at that stuff. And she goes, I'm going to tell you my story. She goes, my son went to Alfred University. And he was in a fraternity. And to pledge to be part of their brothers there. Their brotherhood all together. They made him get into a trunk. There's eight other people into other trunks. And drive them around. And each one had to drink a six pack, a fifth of whiskey, and a quart of wine. And they wouldn't let you out of the trunk until you finished it off. And yet after four hours, they open it up, and there's throw up all over the place, and he's out. They take him up to his room. This is where you take somebody to the hospital. You don't second guess it. And the brothers are scared now. They're going to get into trouble because, you know what? They had somebody really get hurt. The young man died that night. And you know something? That's the first time it ever really woke me up. Because I looked at the mom with the tears coming down. And she said to the audience, would you want your mom up here talking like this? You want her telling that story someday? Brady's talking about a one night problem. That's what he was. He wasn't an alcoholic. He went out for the fun. He went out for the excitement. He forgot about us. It's called getting caught up in the moment. How many kind of know what I mean by that, getting caught up in the moment? You didn't plan to get drunk. You didn't plan to get somebody hurt. But the next thing you know, you're hooked up into all this stuff. And bottom line, she says to me, I want you, when you speak, to tell this story. And tell everybody, if you choose to drink, do it so you don't get drunk. Do it so you don't get effed up. Do it so that you have a good time. And if you really are a teammate, and you really are a brother, my God, you would never let your best friend bleed to death. You'd give him first aid. you never let your friend drink himself to death. And I don't think anybody plans for that to happen. I think it's an automatic. And I think little things like that's where people really get hurt. You know, people go, well, can hazing happen without drinking? Maybe 10% of the time. You know, I'll tell you the one thing that I never thought of when I was in college, we used to love to give people nicknames. How many have a nickname sitting here? How many have a nickname? How many of your buddies call you because something kind of funny with that nickname? You know, I was a freshman. We are going through camp. And the doctor comes in to give us our physicals. And the upperclassmen, they line us all up. And you got to stand in a line, like down in the hallway, naked, while this guy gives you your exam. And there's like 30 of us. And the seniors are looking for something funny. Like the first guy that walks up, the doctor goes, you look like you're 40 years old. You don't have any hair. We're going to call you Baldy. And you know what? That's what we call him. To this day, we call him Baldy. And he'll almost fight you if you call it to his face. He didn't like it. But the seniors did. They like putting him on that way. That's what they call incidental aging. It's not really out to hurt you. It's to be part of the group. When they got me up front, the doctor goes, oh, look at this guy. So they give me the fat caliber test. You know what the fat caliber test is? You know, they put these little things on your back to measure how much fat is back there. And the doctor goes, in all my life, in all my career in business, I've never seen a guy with a back this fat. That's the fattest back I've ever seen. So what do you think my nickname is today? There you go, fat back. And I'm telling you, that has stuck with me for more than 40 years. 
I get inducted to the Hall of Fame for football at my college, and the guy says, we got Greeny up here, Mike Reed, but you all know him as Fatback. And everybody clapped, and, you know, I kind of liked it. I thought it was, you know what, that's, that's what I grew up with, that's what I went through. They're all my boys, they got my back, and they paid the price, and they kind of got the right to do it. But they came down to the beach where I live in Cape May, New Jersey, about a month later playing a practical joke. And my stall at the condo says Mike Green. And they stuck him in, and when I wasn't there, I put in big fat back right here. I pulled my card in, my wife was upset. My kids are upset. They want to know why they call you fat back. I said, you know, in college this happens. It, it's just some way the guys get along. It's no big thing. And my wife goes, to me it is. To our family it is. And that's the thing sometimes down the line that people don't see. What that name you get today, or what you call somebody, or how you hurt somebody, has some consequences with it. So if you're giving somebody nicknames, if you're teasing, you're backing somebody up, making them doing something they shouldn't, as much as you think that's fun, it can't go on. You know, in most of the states across the United States, hazing is illegal. You can't do it. It's illegal by the NCAAs. By that point there, Bottom line, we got to change it something, and that includes me. Because some of this stuff is fun. Some of this is having a good time, but it can hurt at different times. Another one, going out and sexually making terms, saying things to people, or going out to prove to your brothers or the people on your team that you can get more sex than anybody. This is called hooking up sometimes. It's called the walk of shame. And we had a problem with it, the Pirates. It was called Slump Buster. How many have heard of Slump Buster? Where are the baseball players at? So you all have heard of Slump Buster. We have a great manager by the name of Clint Hurdle. And he goes, hey, Greedy, I'm telling you something. You know why we hired you? Because you said one thing that got my attention to change this. It was called all fucks disease. Let me know what that is. Never heard of all fucks disease? Get drunk and horny. You get your arm around somebody, you're smiling. Your friends are going, oh my God. You don't get the hint. You take the person home and you sleep with them. This is where you get all fucks disease. Roll over, look at them and go, oh fuck. How can I have done something like that? How many know somebody that had all fucks disease? And that's what our manager said, you know what? When you said that, I think you said the most honest thing I've ever heard that we need to improve upon. They don't call it that here, they call it slump buster. Which they start going like, you gotta go out, you're in a slump, and sleep with somebody, walk you at the bar, watching what you do, making fun of you, having a great time, and some of the guys go out and hook up with some women, and do things that they shouldn't be doing, especially in a bar, having fun, the other guy's laughing, and the manager said to me, it's going to stop tonight. Because it's part of our culture, it doesn't go on. Where did they ever think that that was okay to do? It's not. I think one of the things you need to identify in this hazy is they call it identifying it and changing it. Walking up to the person and saying, you don't have to do that. You know, it really doesn't work. And the manager said to me, this has been going on for years and years and years, not with our team with all of them, but it is a form of hazing to go out, put your hands on a young lady, hurt her, say something, embarrass her, is out of line. And I think of your special times when you get spring break, when you get holidays off, I think you need to be careful little things like that because you're having fun, sowing your oats. Don't put yourself off to your friends and eat, back it off. That's done not enough. You know, you're not gonna do something like that. I know one person had a shirt that said, young lady walking down the beach, why grab a hiney when you can have a bush? Time to me, that's sexual hazing. They thought it was great because it's a free t-shirt. The lady's got the shirt on. And one of the guys said, go over, go ahead, your initiation, you gotta go over there and meet that young lady, do something funny. Walks over to her and he puts, both his hand, right on her chest, just like that. She goes, move her hands. She goes, circling. 
<laughs> he gets arrested for sexually assaulting her. The fine's $3,500, three months in jail, class A misdemeanor, and worst of all, the young lady's a victim of somebody else's one night problem. And I want to know why we can't stop that. Because like our manager said, we don't identify it. We don't include it in hazing. It's boys will be boys, not anymore. When you see somebody getting out of control, you say something. You're a teammate. You speak up. You go like this. Hold her right there. You don't have the right to hurt her to make us laugh. You've had too much alcohol. Walk the person home. You know what I call it? Spotty. You walk in the weight room every single day. One of your friends goes, can you give me a spot at the bench press? You see your best friend miss the lift? You reach over, grab the barbell, you put it back on the rack so a person doesn't get hurt. How many know what I mean by spotty? Team pursuit. You know, our manager goes, come to practice today and watch what we do. First thing I'm watching is the third base coach. He goes, Randy, he's actually a spotter. Because this responsibility is to keep our players running so they don't get out. When to slide, when to bypass third and go all the way home. He'll put his hands up, he's got signals. We communicate like that. When you see someone hit a fly ball, you hear players go, mine, 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 mine. Back and off, they communicate. But one of the big ones is, I'm watching this in practice and we have one of our guys batting and a pitcher hits him and he falls down to the ground. You know what, the three coaches run out, they pick him up and they walk him all the way down to first base. And you know, I thought, well, that's kind of strange. I've never seen that. You know why? This is a drill for coaches. We want to identify when someone's gotten hurt. Someone said something the wrong way. We walk them down to first. We don't want to fight him. We don't want him thrown out. And we think it's a responsibility of the coach to back somebody up. That's why we have a cutoff man. We have managers. We have coaches. Because we're out there watching each other's back. That's how things have gotten better. And by the way, for the last three years working for them, we went from not being in the playoffs in 20 years, with all the coaches and people we have today, back to the playoffs. Last year we won more games than we've ever had. And one of the big things is we've gotten better not only at spotting, but we've gotten better at things like taking care of each other, educational programs, not easy, and being careful how much you drink. So tonight's program, we're going to really stress that about going out there, taking care of each other, and spotting. How many have ever given one of your friends a spot? Raise your hand. How many have done that? How many walked somebody home with a cute drunk to walk home by themselves? How many sat with somebody all night when they were drunk? How many have seen somebody pee on somebody drunk? All those little things, don't let it go up. We're going to let these guys go come in and then pick it up again. Hey, you got it. For the upper class, my name is Mike Green. I go by the nickname Greeny. I think in my history of speaking now for 30 years, I've probably been to your college 10 different times. I always pride myself because I always liked Virginia Tech. I think it's a great school. And the one thing that I've always done, I've had this for 15 years, I have a Virginia Tech mug, and I put it out with my props every place I go. This has been a good thing because it's educated other people. I walked into the University of Alabama football team gave a speech with them, and had this sitting right up front. And someone really got upset. They screamed a little bit. Hey, hey, why would you bring that into our football room? That's not our colors. We're not Virginia Tech. Why would you do that? And I sit back up and said, the next time one of your friends in this room is going to a bar getting drunk and getting into a fight, would you stand up and go like this? Hey. We need you on the team. We can't afford you to be thrown out. We like you, you're part of our team. You represent a family. And grab him out of there. And the player said, point taken. He said, who gave you the idea? I said, your coach did a long time ago. 
because so many people will go out, drink, get drunk, and you turn your back on your friends. You don't take them home. You don't say something. We were looking for a gimmick to get people, when you go out to say something, to take care of each other. And I'll tell you why I care about that so much. I am a recovering alcoholic, just celebrated 38 years being sober. Thank you very much. And the first place I ever spoke at was for the Philadelphia Flyers ice hockey team. We had a goalie by the name of Pelly Limburg killed in a drink and a driving accident. And our manager said this, why did they let him get into the car? He had a signing bonus. He took everybody out drinking. And they were buying them shots. They were having a good time. They stayed out to 5 o'clock in the morning. There's no way if you're drinking, you're out to 5 o'clock. And he got into his brand new Porsche, flipped it over and was killed. And Bobby Clark goes like this. Did you hear what one of the players said? Why does it always take a death? And then they hire a guy like you. That's why I'm here tonight. It shouldn't take a death. It should take maybe a half an hour of some education, some guidance, to get you to look at this different. For all the people who didn't see the first half hour, watch this. How many of you in this room drink? Raise your hand. How many drink? How many have gotten drunk? How many have thrown up because of a night drinking? How many felt totally shitty the next day because of a night drinking? How many have the shifts the next day because of a night drinking? How many see one of your friends pee in the wrong place because of a night drinking? Now watch. How many have had an alcohol problem? That's why we're doing this. Because to have an alcohol problem does not mean you're an alcoholic. In fact, we give it a different name. I invented this. It's called a one-night problem. It's a short-term <laughs> problem of one night that has a consequence. That one night that you go out, you go like this. I've been out for three weeks. I've been lifting. I've been training. I've been doing everything right. Tonight, it's my night. I'm getting wasted because I deserve it. And you have terms like wasted, trash, garbage, pounded, hammered, destroyed, annihilated. And it turns as opposed to you are, you sip it, you taste it, you enjoy it, you socialize, you have a good time. And there's two terms that you never use. One is getting effed up, and the other one's shit-faced. Because when you go to that extreme, there's definitely going to be a problem. In Alcoholics Anonymous, we have a little joke. I'm addicted to the 51st state of the union. It's a state of being effed up. You know, there are people like me, I'm not cured. I get on my knees every morning, I ask God to keep me sober, thank him again at nighttime. I'm only one drink away from a drunk. <coughs> so tonight, when I said, we want to be safe, we want to have a good time, the first one-nighter I will share with you is I just spoke down in a school in Florida that has a great basketball team, but you know, the athletic director at this school is a friend of mine. He used to be the athletic director at Bradley University. And he sees me and he goes like this, one night problems. There it is, one night problems, I'll never forget it. He said, we had our soccer team at Bradley go out and have initiation night called Hazy. The whole team has to go out. And they made the younger players get drunk. And you know what, one of the players went home to his house, the players made sure they got him back, and then the hazing event. They played a practical joke. Somebody bought these fire rockets this big. They went up to his room, threw the door open, and threw the bottle rockets in. It caught on fire. Within 10 minutes, the entire place burned down. And we lost a soccer player burned to death. And he goes, hey, Greeny, do you remember my associate? He picked me up there at the airport when I spoke out there. He used to really get upset with your language about you saying F dumb. But you know what, today, he tells a story like this. I wish I would have listened to Greeny and his one-nighters. 
He wasn't trying to insult anybody. He's been around. He was trying to save a life. My son, I heard him say earlier in the daytime, I'm going out tonight to get effed up. I should have grabbed him and said something. I did it. And they went out with all the guys, had a really good time. But he lost his life. And the athletic director says to me, you know, Greeny, when I went down to the jail that night, and I bailed the three people out that threw the bottle rockets, they were sitting there going like this. You know, Coach, it's everything that guy Greeny speaks about. None of us are alcoholics. It was our hazy night. It wasn't to hurt anybody. It was to have a good time. We got caught up in the moment. Things got out of control. And look what happened. All three of those guys did six months in jail. The father testified for him. He didn't want him to go to jail. And he said, I really believe they all care about each other. They got up caught up in the moment one night. And they did something stupid. Before you guys came in, I told the younger group here, we had a young lady, the first person I ever heard speak about easy. Her name was Eileen Stevens. She said, my son was forced when he pledged at Alfred University. He was asked in part of the pledging, the hazy night. He had to drink a six pack of beer. He had to drink a fifth of whiskey. And he had a quart of wine to drink also, locked in a trunk. And he had four hours to do it. When I opened that trunk up four hours later, he was dead. And he says, I want you to tell everybody in the room, what do you think it's like if their mother had to stand up in front of a room talking about that. They lost their son because he got caught up in the moment with a great team because they weren't taking care of each other. And bottom line, it happened so fast it's not funny. And then another one. This glass right here causes more problems than I've ever seen. What's the name of the glass? It's called a jigger, cordial, sipping, fine-tuning. Try not to give it a negative name like shot, shooter, destroyer, or killer shot. We had someone die in Michigan on their initiation night on a basketball team. They played the game Power Hour. He did it with Jack Daniels. He had 29 shots in 27 minutes. Died of bad blood alcohol levels 0.67. Tonight to take one of the first year players out and put that on him, there's no way that should happen. And they lost somebody. And the one I like to tell, University of Vermont. I used to work for them. We had a great ice hockey team. And the coach goes, you gotta come in here and speak to the ice hockey team. Which I do, and he goes, Greedy, they have this one night. They don't think I know about it. They all go out, they get together, and they pour alcohol on each other. And the young guys have to drink 15 shots of tequila. So I spoke to him. I thought he did a good job. I thought they got the point. The next year, they had no problems that year. The next year before I got into the school, they had the initiation problem, uh, celebration earlier. The story goes this way. They got 15 young men drunk drinking tequila. And when they got them drunk, they go like this. Now that you're drunk, you gotta take your clothes off and run naked across the campus holding each other by the dawn. And in college, they call this the elephant walk. Can you imagine 15 men walking across the campus holding each other like that? You know what it creates? Everybody has a cell phone. Everyone wants to take a picture. And now people are taking pictures. They didn't expect that one of those pictures got back to the president of the university. And she called him in the next day and she went like this. We had a report you were running naked across our campus. Swear to God it wasn't us. And she pulled the picture out, she had him dead to rights. Because you lied to us, not because of what you did. She dropped the sport of hockey that year. With 15 games left in the season, we don't need people dropping the sport. She made a point that a human life is more important than a night of hazing anytime. You never take somebody out and do that. They didn't expect anybody to get hurt. But what they didn't expect, one of the parents came back and sued the college. And the next thing you know is, I'm not working up there anymore. They got somebody else to do the program. The athletic director, he's not working there anymore either. 
Rick Fordham, he lost his job. The ice hockey coach, he lost the job also. The president of the college, she lost her job. And so did the vice president. All over a night of going out hazy, look at all the people that got hurt. And he goes, you know what? When people go out and they get caught up in the moment, having fun, look how fast it takes people down. It should have never gone on. And the big thing with all this, I really believe nobody takes anybody out to hurt somebody. I think drinking, if you do it the right way, is fun. You know, working for the Pittsburgh Pirates, we try to get that point across all the time. It's a night to relax, to socialize and go out. It's not a night to hurt somebody. It's not a night to put your hands on somebody. To go out, you know, someone's wearing a shirt down the beach. Why grab a hiney when you could have a bush? You think that's funny. Your friends tell you to go over and put your hands on her. Put the hands on the person, just like that. Move your hands. Boom! And the next thing you know, we got somebody arrested for sexually assaulting somebody. The reason I tell that story again is my son played college football at a school called Hobart and William Smith. He was first team academic All-American, co-captain of the team. He was also an RA. And he goes, you know what, Dad, when we were 5-0, we came back about 10 o'clock at night. There was a big party going on. It was Halloween. And I had to work that night, and we had some guys down in a barn where the big <coughs> party sat, trying to get the first-year students drunk. It was a soccer team. They were trying to get these young ladies drunk. They were trying to do something funny. And they did something. Young lady got drunk. Next thing you know, there was a sexual assault allegation. The police show up. And bottom line, the school gets sued. Three players on the team are off. And my son goes, why didn't somebody say something? That's the most important thing going. And if you leave this program tonight with anything, I mean this. Being able to stand up and say something. I call it spotty. You walk all the way when someone goes, can you give me a spot at the bench press? You see your best friend miss the lift? You reach over, grab the barbell, put it back on the rack so a person doesn't get hurt. You know, my wife came up with this. She gave me a spot. We're driving in Cape May. Guy cut me off at a red light, looked at me really bad. Threw me the finger. How many of had somebody throw you the finger? How many throw it back automatically? This guy gets out of his car, start chasing, I'm chasing him around his car. My wife is chasing me around the car. I'm really pissed off. My wife goes like this, spoke up nice and loud. You want to hit that guy in front of your two children? And I got back in the car. And I was actually pissed at her. I said, why'd you say that? I almost had him because we don't need you locked up. You did that in front of your children. What were you thinking? I never thought about it that way. What were you thinking? But it took one person to stand up and say something. By the way, she's sitting over here. How about we have you stand up and give you a little round of applause? I would say thank you at that point. And my son goes like this later. You know, someone at Hope Park would have went like this. And let that young lady alone. It's out of bounds. Let her go. It's not right. Guess what? We wouldn't have that problem. Nobody said anything. Everybody looks the other way. When you finally become a leader, you'll be able to say something. You'll be able to go out and step out and say, hey, it's wrong. And you know something? I did it back when I was in my fraternity. I never looked at it that way. We had initiation night. I was second year in college, I was already in. You had to come in front of us sitting down in the basement. All the lights are off. About 50 guys there. The three big headlights up on you while you stood there and answered questions. We had one guy come in, and I don't know who came up with this, but they asked this one guy to take a spoon that was sitting on the table and hold it back in his cheeks why we're asking him questions. Naked to the skin. And I got a little bit upset with that. There's no way that should be going on. And then all of a sudden they made him take it out, put it back on the table, and he was allowed to go. And I started saying, you know what, hey, that's out of line. 
Next guy comes to it. And they ask that guy to pick up the spoon and put it in his mouth. And then I said something. I actually stood up and went like this. Hey, that's wrong. It's not a brotherhood. You guys are over here trying to get him because you don't like him. We're here to help him. He's not going to do it. And if you're going to try to make him, I'm going to stand with him. And you have to go through me. Three other football players stood up. You have to go through all of us. Because it's out of line. And really, we shouldn't have you guys in here for coming up with that idea. Because you think it's okay to do that with somebody? But see, when you hear stuff like that going on, and you look back at it, you guys can change some of this culture. You can say things. You can go out there and say it's not right. Put people in charge. Because when all these things go on, you get people hurt. How many ever got, a, how many ever got hurt because of the night drinking? How many have fallen up steps? How many have fallen down steps? How many have gotten a UPI? Never heard of a UPI? The guy sitting up front with a great big band-aid on his forehead. What happened to you? It's called a UPI. Which is what? Unidentified party injury. To get up the next day, you have a bump, lump or bruise on your body, have no idea how it got there. How many have had one? I said, what happened to you? He goes, spring break. Met three young ladies drinking a drink called a Zulu Warrior Zambini Barbarian Punch. I never answered dinner. I find out later it was something called Everclear. <laughs> Look at that reaction. <laughs> if you drink Everclear, you'll never be clear. It should be mixed 25 shots of soda to one shot of Everclear. And he goes, I had three drinks sitting down. I felt fine. I stood up. It hit me like lightning. I passed out. You think those three young ladies would drive me home? They played a practical joke. They took me to a tattoo parlor. Got me a tattoo on my forehead. Here we go and haze it again. Tattoo on the forehead. You can't tattoo anybody. What type of tattoo do you have? I had a flying penis tattooed on my forehead. You had a flying penis tattooed on your forehead. He goes, you know what? He whips the bandaid off and he goes, had a skin graft. And you tell everybody, when the laughing wears off, this is a permanent injury for a lifetime. It never goes away. Now, I don't know where my friends were. Why did I think that was funny to do? You know, a lot of tattooing and a lot of things like that go on in spring break, especially at the Mardi Gras, especially at really good places that have a lot of fun going on. Make sure it's your choice. Not because someone's hazing, someone trying to get you to do that. And all those things I think sometimes really get people hurt. Now on the other one, how many have a day you like to go out and drink? How many like Thursday night? How many like Fridays? How many like Saturdays? What's your favorite? Give me a favorite holiday you like. New Year's Eve? Give me another one. St. Patrick's Day, Halloween, anything else? Cinco de Mayo, anything else? If you look at this for a minute, when I crawled in to get sober, the therapist said to me, can you tell me the days you drank back in college? Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays. Only three days a week. She goes, yeah, but if I drink every Thursday night, that's 52 times a year. You do Thursday and Friday, that's 104 days. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday is 156 days. If you walk in my office, go, Coach, I want to get stronger, what should I do? Hey, lift weights three days a week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, follow the program. If you never miss, I'll guarantee you'll get stronger because you put the time in. How many agree you put the time in, nothing gets stronger? Want to have a really good alcohol problem? Bring a recovering alcoholic in. You'll have a lot of one-nighters. And don't we have great holidays? St. Patrick's Day, New Year's Eve, NCAA basketball playoff, that's a full month, grades coming out, all type of holidays. <laughs> I had someone down in Tennessee on the football team go like this. Coach, I don't drink. They went in the room, you drink worse than anybody in this room. He says, I drink beer. Beer's not alcohol, is it? 
What do you think it is? <laughs> Beer is the same as a shot. He goes, you know what? I do Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays. All these holidays, I figured out I got drunk almost 300 times. I don't want to end up alcoholic like you. I come back the next year, you went from 300 down to 90. The next year from 90 down to 40. But see, now he's captain. Now he's an All-American. Now he's got the pros looking at him. In his senior year when he graduated, he didn't drink at all. And he goes like this. That program got me to look. How many go out drinking because it's just what everybody does? It's called liquid bonding. You go out and have a good time because of all the hard work, and the next thing you know, you're getting caught up in all this stuff. And he goes, all those things you talked about hazy, forcing people to drink, giving them nicknames, taking them out, making them force them to drink hard alcohol, cutting hair, tattoos. It all violates the state laws, and it violates the NCAA. So in talking about this stuff, like I told my son, when you go out, you know something? I'd like to see you drink. I mean that. I don't want to see you end up like me, alcoholic. And the greatest gift I could ever give you is to teach you how it happened to me. Number one is I never cared about anybody but myself. I went out to get effed up Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. I did all those holidays. And you know something at graduation? He was number one in his class. And the president of the college came over and goes, boy, you gotta be proud of your son. I am. All those awards, but the biggest thing that made me happy is he drank all four years of college. He never got drunk. He never missed a class. He never got arrested. He never did anything to hurt anybody. He never got caught up in hazy. He became a spotter. And my son goes, you know, Dad, maybe you ought to tell that instead of all those people that did it wrong. Because college is your life. It's your social time. But you don't want to see somebody get hurt. Because when it comes to this and going out and having fun, it should be just that, fun, not hurting somebody. And my last piece of advice, two years ago at Easter when my brother called and said we lost Patrick. Patrick, somebody that went to college and wrestled. He was really in big time cutting weight at different times. He liked Oxycontin every now and then. Then he got addicted to marijuana and alcohol, and finally to heroin. And he got a year sober. And we all worked with him really, really hard. We all became spotters back, watching his back. And everybody thinks he's okay, he went to a concert. We call this people, places, and things. And the next thing you know, that morning they find him in bed with a needle in his arm, the heroin sitting there, and my brother going like this. How come we could have never taught him to do other things besides drink and drugs? Why is it always that? Isn't there a different way to bond? Can't you go out with your buddies, go to a nice dinner, sit down, and it doesn't have to be anything to do with hazing or drinking. Can't you get together and go bowling one night? How about a fishing trip? Can't you go on a fishing trip without taking alcohol there to get people drunk? Can't you go down to the boardwalk in New Jersey, hang out with your friends and have a good time? Can't you do all these things? Why does everything have to be alcohol get drunk? I don't know. It's what we did. Yeah, and it got us. It got him. And Bob point with all this stuff is, there's got to be a better way. See, when I come in here tonight, it's a chance maybe to help somebody. Look at what you're doing. Slow it down. And you know something? I'll be here afterwards. If you have a question, come up and ask. But this was not to hurt. This was not to take away. This was basically to educate on all the stuff that's going on on campuses. Thank you very much for letting me speak with everybody. Thank you.